you're liking your dessert. It's my favorite dessert here. I'm going to start our um, discussion because I find it extremely relevant to what we're going through in this country. Our country was based on, on different opinions, and thank God we have these different opinions because our country becomes better and better because we have it. And so this is an opinion that um, I think needs to be talked about today. Now, S Scott Johnson is a multifaceted guy. Um, we had a conversation yesterday, and by the time I finished, I said, what haven't you succeeded in? <laughs> he, he's written this, I think this is your first uh, novel that he's written, but he's written other books. He's a money manager, a hedge fund manager, uh, a nightclub owner, uh, a technology uh, investor. Not all at the same time. <laughs> no, but they're all different times. But he's multifaceted and has had a huge career. And he's going to write another book, which we'll, he will tell you about. But this one is really fun to read because most of us of our age will identify with what's going on with it. And it's humorous. And there will be a book for you, but please do not, if you have a book, please don't take it. We don't have enough for everybody, but we want to make sure you can get this, to get the book, because it's really worthwhile. Today he's going to be talking about camp, campus land. It's the radical takeover of our educational system. And I think this something will be relevant to all of us, whether your children or grandchildren or future grandchildren. So how we see our educational system. <coughs> so I'd like to introduce this terrific guy, <laughs> Scott Johnson. Uh, thanks, Dale. Thanks for having me here. This is great. Free, the free state of Florida. Delighted to be here. <laughs> um, it's great to see some old friends. Um, it's great to see amongst the uh, staff here some of my old friends from National Golf Links. Um, yeah, that was a nice surprise. Um, I'd like to, I'm going to start with a quote from Lenin. Uh, now, he, awful man, Lenin, but very quotable, as it turns out. And, and he once said, there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. I always like that quote. And that also describes what's happening to American culture right now, particularly over the last 18 months or so. Um, our last 18 months has been like one of Lenin's weeks. Uh, so this is kind of the story of how our culture is changing, and changing at perhaps the fastest pace in our nation's history, particularly where education is concerned, but not just there. Uh, it's also the story of how I ended up on the front lines of all this, um, because I'm somewhat of an accidental cult culture warrior, but, but I've, I've found myself there. Um, and by the way, all this is being driven by a remarkably small percentage of our populace. But they have found um, what I call posi professional positions of maximum cultural leverage. Uh, and they leverage also social media very effectively. Um, but this all started for me a few years ago when I went to an event at Yale. Um, it was uh, a one-day symposium on the future of free speech. Um, now, just in case you think Yale sponsored it, they didn't. Um, they, they don't go for that much anymore. Um, it, but it was held physically on the campus. And before the afternoon was out, 200 undergraduates had shown up with signs uh, that they somehow found time to make. And they were screaming outside, and they, they tried to physically shut the conference down. Um, using their free speech rights to shut down a conference on free speech, they, I have it on good authority, they all skipped irony class that day. Um, so as I was, I was walking out, I remember Roger Kimball and I, the, the journalist, we were walking out at the same time, uh, and we walked through this phalanx of 200 screaming, spitting kids. And I remember thinking, why, why hasn't anyone used all this craziness that's going on in college campuses for, to, to write a, a, a good satiric novel? Like, where's Tom Wolfe when you need him? But dead, as it turns out. 
Um, and he did write I Am Charlotte Simmons, but it wasn't really about this, and it wasn't, also wasn't his best book. Um, and it didn't occur to me at the time that I should write such, such a book, because I, I knew nothing about writing fiction. I'd never tried it before. Um, so fast forward to my college reunion, and late one night, I'm holding a door open for an undergraduate, and she stops dead in her tracks, and she looks at me, and she says, patriarchy. Said, what? Your behavior is patriarchal. So I said, I don't think so. And you know, my mother would be very upset if I <laughs> did, didn't hold this door open. So we had a standoff for a minute or two where I stood there holding the door open, and she stood there and wouldn't want to go through it. And I, I think boredom over, overcame her principles before my desire for another drink overcame mine. <laughs> uh, so I won the standoff. Um, a very small victory in the culture wars. Um, and it was really at that moment I said, I'm going to figure out how to write a goddamn novel. Excuse my language. Um, and um, I did. Um, and it was a very unlikely story that got uh, a publisher right away. Um, that's a whole different story. Uh, although I remember um, my editor saying, it will be published in 15 months. And I said, what? Why does it take so long? Well, that's how long it always takes. Um, Apparently, there's a schedule to these things, and it takes a while to go through the editing process and all that. And I was very concerned, because um, Campus Land is uh, a satiric novel. Uh, it takes place at a, uh, a, a, an Ivy League-like campus called um, Devon University, um, located in Havenport, Connecticut. <laughs> Let you draw your own conclusions. Um, and what I was writing about uh, you know, the, the culture on college campuses was moving so fast that I was concerned fi by f in 15 months the book would already be outdated. Um, but uh, it ended up doing um, very well. Got to number 15 on Amazon. Uh, you know, I'm happy to say it's going to be a TV series. Um, and I I'm going to read a short. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's, um, it has a producer and a distributor, and they're interviewing actors and screenwriters and everything right now. And it, my understanding of this process is that at some point, when there's enough momentum and all that, they go to Amazon or to Netflix and, and sell it. So that's kind of where it stands. Um, they occasionally actually involve me in the process, which surprised me. Because <laughs> I always heard that authors were the, the very tail end of the process. All I told them in our first conference call was, Bonfire of the Vanities, which sometimes Campus Land gets compared to. Bonfire of the Vanities is the movie. Don't do that. I don't know if you saw it. It's one of the worst movies from one of the best books ever. Uh, I'm going to read a short passage um, kind of to make a point. Um, so bear with me one second while I find the spot. So this is a, our, our protagonist hero is a, uh, a professor of English at Devon, and, and he's up for tenure this year. And needless to say, there's some roadblocks that he doesn't see coming. But uh, he's at, in this scene, he's at an a fac English faculty meeting, English department, uh, and they're talking about, uh, a, actually, there's a, a new hire amidst them um, named Blue Feather, Sophie Blue Feather. Um, and so moving on, said Titus Cooley, who's the uh, head of the department, we will be hiring a new assistant professor. I have emailed you the curricula vitae of the candidates should you have any feedback, interviews begin next week. Lastly, excuse me, professor, it was Sophie Bluefeather, poetry. Arrived at Devon last year with full tenure, which was rare. Everyone quietly assumed she was Native American, but to F, that's our protagonist, she looked as white as Titus Cooley. Was he the only one who noticed? He knew better than to ask. Professor Bluefeather, Titus said. Bluefeather rose out of her seat. It appears that all the candidates you sent us are cisgender. I urge the department in the strongest possible term, terms to increase its LGBT representation, particularly trans. It is imperative that we break the heteronormative paradigm. Now there's a mouthful, thought F. <laughs> Professor Bluefeather herself was a self-described pangenderist. She cut a striking figure, 40-ish, with severe black rim glasses and a pixie haircut dyed smurf blue. When F first met her, she came right out and said, yes, I'm pangender. It was a challenge, as if she could read his thoughts, which squirmed uncomfortably in the presence of anyone whose sexuality didn't adhere to traditional boundaries. 
she was daring him to say something. He was a deer in the headlights. Maybe it was because he didn't know what the hell a pangenderist was. Weren't polysexuals a thing too? Later, in private, he had turned to Google and discovered a robust palette of gender options. Facebook, for instance, allowed users to choose from 58, although he frequently found the definitions confusing. For instance, he couldn't see that there was a difference between an androgyne and a hermaphrodite. For that matter, how was something called neither a gender, and why was it different from other, and why were there both cisgender women and cisgender females? And wasn't a two-spirit just a gay Indian? <laughs> F, F imagined some faceless social force conjuring up nuanced gender alternatives behind the scenes. Pangender, he discovered, described people who embodied all genders within themselves. All 58? How did they decide what to wear in the morning? <laughs> and just to make sure you had things straight, a polysexual was someone who liked getting busy with the other 57. F wasn't sure he knew any polysexuals, but they must be popular at parties. Uh, cisgender, Titus asked, looking as though he immediately regretted asking it. That would be you, professor, said Sophie Bluefeather, pangenderist. The room broke out in laughter, although Bluefeather's expression didn't change. Ah, so you mean normal. There were audible gasps. He'd used the N-word, the other one. We don't say normal, Professor, Bluefeather said. Uh, right, because I suppose that would imply, if one thought it through, that others were uh, abnormal. Yes, Professor. Poor Titus was doing his best to keep up with the cultural tides, but the tides were moving faster than a man of his age could swim. So the reason I read that particular um, part was because I think the, the number, of JD, uh, number of genders is in the 80s now. And so there are f forces behind the scenes coming up with these nuanced gender distinctions literally every week. And if you read through them, it's, it, it's actually almost comical. But if you go on any college campus, it's taken very, very seriously. Um, so, so much else has changed. Um, the number of bureaucrats. Um, the villain in campus land is the head of diversity and inclusion. And I was trying to decide how many um, people I should give, put in her department. And originally I wrote 20. And then before the book came out, I, I changed it to 30. I like, ah, this is satire. I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to exaggerate. Um, but I did go on Harvard and Yale's websites to see how many, I call them diversocrats, there really are. And I couldn't find out the number. Um, almost to the day that Campus Line came out, I found, I found out the real number at Yale was 150. Now, it's likely double that now. Um, Right around when Campus Land came out, there was also a story that came out that there were, the number of bureaucrats at Yale had then exceeded the number of professors. This was two years ago. Last month, a story came out that Yale's bureaucracy, the, the numbers now exceed the number of undergraduates. <laughs> this is just in two years. There, there, there are 6,000 undergrads at Yale. So that means there are 6,000 something bureaucrats. Uh, and they all have titles like, uh, uh, assistant Dean of Community Affairs, like Lord knows what he does all day. The Title IX um, and diversity departments are by far the biggest bloat, though. Um, so this was not alone, the campus land, enough to sort of put me on the front lines. What really got me there was uh, a, a bit later, um, so fast forward to about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Um, I, a very strange thing. In the fall of 2020, uh, you know, something extraordinary happened in our schools, particularly the most elite private ones. Something parents began noticing as they listened in, you know, in the background of their kids' Zoom sessions. Uh, a new philosophy had taken hold, uh, seemingly overnight, uh, referred to by schools as anti-racism. Now, anti-racism is a clever use of nomenclature because it sounds nice, right? It sounds like you're not a racist. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, in fact, it, it kind of means the opposite. One of the purveyors of this is someone named Ibram X. Kendi, who you might have heard of. Uh, and he's been, he's been on the record just saying the only solution for past racism is current racism, but in the other direction. Uh, and all of a sudden, this was shown, showing up in all these schools. And kids were being forced into groups um, based on their skin color. Uh, you were either oppressed or an oppressor, one or the other. 
If you're white, you're an oppressor. This is being taught to kindergartners. Right. And, and there, there was a bit of inconvenience, though, in the narrative because um, Indians from the subcontinent and Asians were very successful minority groups that didn't fit the narrative very well. So they're now called white adjacent, just for the record. <laughs> um, they were also being taught, all these kids, that America is a fundamental evil, evil place. Uh, the 1619 Project from the New York Times has a lot to do with that. Um, this was really nothing more than a new twist on, on Marx, with the oppressed being redefined as, um, instead of being the proletariat monetarily uh, oppressed, uh, it, 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 the oppressed are defined by, sk by skin color. Other, otherwise, we're talking standard Marxism. Um, I call it ethno-Marxism. Um, so back to about a year ago, uh, I was contacted by someone who was on the inside at Dalton uh, and had, um, was privy to everything that went on in board meetings and so on. And they were having a bit of an existential crisis because their faculty and administrators had issued um, an eight-page long series of demands that uh, I, it's, it's on, I have a blog called The Naked Dollar. You can read them all. Uh, if you go back to last December, you, you just wouldn't believe some of the stuff in it. Um, it included things like getting rid of all AP classes because the black students weren't qualifying them in the same numbers. Uh, if you donated money to Dalton, half that money should be redirected to the New York City public school system. Um, it, it, the black faculty members should automatically be paid more than white faculty members. Uh, this went on and on and on for eight pages. Um, so this person I knew reached out to me and said, you know, maybe you'd like to put this on your blog because this is nuts. And uh, you know, I, so I've been blogging for years, but not very religiously. I'm not one of these people who writes a blog every day. I only write um, a blog when I feel like I have something to say um, that's maybe not being said elsewhere. So this qualified. So I wrote about it, and, and because I don't blog regularly, I, you, know, the, you know, I might get a couple thousand hits when I write something. When I wrote about this, it went absolutely berserk. I remember I was down here in Florida with my family, and I said, Kelly, that's my wife, look at this. And I, every time I'd hit click, like refresh, there'd be 25 new hits. Like, whoa, something's going on. This has hit a nerve. Um, I subsequently wrote more pieces about Dalton because Every time they started reacting to um, to my blog uh, in very awkward ways, uh, even talking about it in a faculty meeting that it was on a Zoom that, of course, I immediately got access to, um, and uh, they immediately took down the names of their board members uh, off the website. Uh, but I used something called the Wayback Machine. In about 30 seconds, I found the names of the, web, of the board members and I put them on my blog. Um, and the, uh, the Wall Street Journal asked me to do a um, an opinion piece on it, which I did. Uh, so over the course of about six weeks, uh, the Naked Dollar got a million hits, which is just absurd. Uh, but clearly a nerve had been struck. And then all of a sudden I became the guy to go to from, uh, for parents from other schools with those schools' issues, which were all basically the same. Um, so I ended up writing about Brearley. I ended up writing about uh, um, Spence. Um, um, the uh, Grace Church School, um, and, uh, I, and I ended up getting more information over the transom than I knew what to do with. I mean, I, I wasn't going to make my profession writing a new blog every week about a new school, and some, at some point the stories got a little repetitive, but this really put me on the front lines and uh, got me, you know, a few haters out there as well. Um, but, uh, so how, how did all this happen? How did schools very suddenly become completely radicalized. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief history of this. Um, and it, you know, it starts with Marx, uh, a madman writing in the British Library. Um, and Marx thought that the proletariat would rise up everywhere and overthrow their oppressors and seize the means of production. What well, didn't really happen, um, and this has often disappointed Marxists because while Marxism did take hold in a number of places, it, didn't, it wasn't because the proletariat rose up, and not even in Russia. I mean, Russia, if you remember, there was about a six-month period where there was a provisional democratic government, and the Marxists took over in a, in a, in a coup. Um, so um, this was very frustrating as time went on that particularly in places like America, the proletariat wasn't rising up. Uh, so this is a problem that needed to be fixed uh, in terms of the doctrine. So along comes a, um, 
a guy in the 60s, uh, a sort of nebbish Italian fellow named Antonio Gramsci. Uh, and he believed that the ruling class used culture more than economics uh, as, as their tool of oppression. And it was society's institutions, the corporations, the media, the churches, the entertainment industry, um, that conveyed that culture. And he said that Marxists had to start playing an inside game and a long game. And this is a direct quote from, from Gramsci. Um, Socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. So it was soon dubbed the long march through the institutions. But Gramsci himself couldn't have understood how his vision would be realized because it happened with a, a uniquely American twist through the crucible of race. So enter something called critical theory. Critical theory, this is really the Reader's Digest version of all this, by the way. Critical theory was born in 1930s Germany uh, and was uh, cultivated by coffeehouse Marxists across uh, Europe through, through, um, through the century. Now ask 10 people what critical theory is and you'll get 10 different answers. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find this progressive word salad that is completely confusing, but intentionally so. It's meant, it's meant to keep you out of the club. Um, so there is, there is a consistent theme, though, which is that there are no absolute truths, that truth is a, a social construct that stems from power. So those with the power, those that control society's institutions, can create whatever truths they want. So everybody keeping up? So if this sounds ridiculous, go on any campus, and it's taken very seriously. Um, so if you believe in critical theory, you suddenly have a shorthand way to dismiss everything you don't like from the past, say Western civilization and the Enlightenment, because those were simply constructs, constructs of the, the DWEs that had power at the time, dead white Europeans. But you also have an incentive to take over society's institutions because then you have the power and, and the truth is yours to create. It's what you say it is. Which brings us to the 1970s and critical race theory. So enter Derek Bell, who was a law professor at Harvard, um, taught Obama, amongst other people. Um, so his bright idea was to inject race into critical theory. Um, and, and in this take, uh, it was white people who had the power all along, and therefore they controlled the culture. And they controlled it in such a way as to oppress blacks. Since whites had controlled America since its founding, everything about America was therefore permeated with racism. Uh, it permeated our entire country and our institutions, and this is where the concept of systemic racism was born. Well, if every institution is racist, the only solution is to burn it all down, because they're inherently corrupt, or make them your own. Then you get to create the truth. So, Gramsci's long march and, and critical race theory made steady but slow progress for several decades, but then in the spring of 2020, CRT, critical race theory, would have its moment. Um, Lenin's week of change would happen, and it came in the form of a felonious drug addict named George Floyd. And we all know what happened to him was a, was a tragedy, but in, in some ways I compare him. Does anyone know the, remember the name Gavril, um, uh, what is the heck, Gavril uh, Princip? Anyone remember that? Very good. We have clever people in the audience. He was 20, 21 years old, I think, and a nobody. 17, 17. okay, a teenager. And his, his single act um, changed the entire course of the 20th century, uh, inadvertently. But he, what he did unleashed a series of dominoes, a series of pent-up forces that, that uh, led to World War II, World War I and World War II, uh, and, and communism and fascism and everything. It was one guy. Now, you could argue it might have happened otherwise, but he was the first domino. Uh, and in many ways, uh, that's George Floyd, or perhaps you could say it's Derek Chauvin, since he was the one who committed the act. Um, so Lenin's week was upon us. Um, so the Floyd tragedy, uh, combined with the existential distraction of COVID, um, gave the keepers of the CRT flame uh, the Abram Candies and the Nicole Hannah Jones, she's the author of the uh, 1619 Project, uh, the opportunity to step on the gas. And step on the gas, they did. 
Um, schools everywhere retool their entire curricula, particularly the private ones, because they could do it faster. Um, and they did this over the summer of 2020. And so, and they did this with the help of um, DEI, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Consultants, who, that's now a major industry in America. Um, and most of them are utterly corrupt and, and odious. Um, the NAIS, the National Association of Independent Schools, was completely complicit and on board with the entire thing. In fact, it, now schools that don't get on board with this are threatened with decertification. Um, parents were never actually consulted in any of this. And it turns out that, that white parents didn't particularly like having their seven-year-olds called oppressors. Um, and it turns out that most black parents didn't particularly like having their seven-year-olds labeled as permanently oppressed and incapable of doing anything without the munificent hand of the white man. Um, so that was about the point where I got involved. Um, and we ended up having this sort of cabal in the early days, the early days being just a year ago. Um, there was uh, Barry Weiss, who's done a lot of writing on the subject, um, Chris Rufo uh, in New York, um, Andrew Gutman, who was the parent who wrote the famous letter uh, when he yanked his daughter out of uh, Brearley, Paul Rossi from the Grace Church School who got fired um, but was a whistle for being a whistleblower there on what was going on there, um, Azra Nomani, who uh, started a group called Defending Ed in Loudoun County in Virginia, which became a, hot, a hotbed for all this and, and uh, led to the defeat of uh, Terry McAuliffe in Virginia, who had famously <laughs> promised that parents would have no role in their kids' education and they, didn't, they shouldn't want one. Um, so we all got to know each other and it was interesting in the early days. And I'm glad to say it's more than a cabal now. I mean, I, this is, there's a big um, pushback nationwide on this, although I'm not gonna say we're winning. I, I'd say most emphatically we are still losing uh, if anyone here gives money to their universities or private schools, think twice about it because they really need to be defunded. A little hard when Yale has $42 billion, though, and Harvard has $52 billion. They don't really care about my check anymore. Um, which leads me, I want to talk about um, some of the people I put blame on for this. Uh, I call them the lovely people. Uh, I was really, with each piece that I wrote in The Naked Dollar about each new school, I would always put the names of the board members um, in the blog, uh, which was great fun. I, I, I actually got lobbied a couple times to take people's names off. Um, I didn't. Um, but the lovely people are, um, everyone here knows a bunch of the lovely people. There may be lovely people in the audience right now. Um, I started wondering how board members of these schools, and indeed all of our institutions, because the long march has been completed, right? Our institutions are now completely co-opted by the woke progressive left, um, and so not just schools. But I started wondering how uh, some of these people that, that I knew could be on these boards and literally be o overseeing the overthrow of Western civilization, because that's what they're doing. Um, and so I, I gave it a lot, of, I, I interviewed a bunch of people and uh, I wrote a piece about it on The Naked Dollar if you want to read it. It was posted last spring or summer um, called All the Lovely People. Uh, and they are mostly very successful because you know they're on boards, they must be. Uh, very wealthy. Politics generally probably centrist. Um, and yet they were going along with all this. They were allowing this to happen. None of them were raising their hands saying, you know, wait, wait, this is, this is too much. This is going too far. Um, we agree with a lot of the, we agree that diversity is important. We, we agree we should be reaching out. We agree on many things, but, but we, you know, when you start leaving our kids oppressors and oppre or oppressed, um, you know, maybe, that's, maybe that's not something we should agree on. No, but those hands were not being raised, and they're still not being raised. And so I did write a piece exploring all this, and a lot of it in schools has to do with the fact that they're afraid for their kids, which is understandable. So they're afraid, uh, you know, Yale or Harvard won't happen. Um, the recommendation letters won't have the requisite adjectives. Um, and believe me, that happens. The, um, the crowd on the inside of this, the, the, uh, the, the woke mafia, they will absolutely take it out on you and take it out on your kids and cancel culture is real. Um, so uh, there's a lot of fear. There's a tremendous amount of fear. But someone at some point has to raise their hand up and say stop. Stop this. This is insane. This is not America. Um, 
So I, I want to quote, so if you know any lovely people, please talk to them. Um, and I say they're lovely because if they were sitting next to you right now, you'd have a lovely conversation. They, they're, they are lovely people, but they're literally overseeing uh, the overthrow of our culture. And I think there's a lot of good things about our culture in America. I really do. Um, so I want to close with a quote that I just stumbled on yesterday from a Canadian journalist named Tara Henley. And this jumped right out at me. She just quit from the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, um, rather like Barry Weiss famously did from the New York Times uh, before her. Um, she said, it used to be that I was the one furthest to the left in any newsroom, occasionally causing strain in story meetings with my views on issues like the housing crisis. I am now easily the most conservative, free, conservative one there, frequently sparking tension by questioning identity politics. This happened in the span of about 18 months. My own politics didn't change. That's how much, maybe in the pleasant bubble here in Palm Beach, um, you're, you're not acutely aware of how fast this is moving, but that's how fast it's moving. So if, if, if I'm sure lots of you touch in various ways many important institutions, it's, imp it's important to be the one to raise your hand and say, wait, stop. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say. I'm sure we can have a nice conversation. I'm sure there may be some questions and probably some people will disagree with me, which is fine. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, that's what we're supposed Anybody to do. Else, would you have an organization like that? Um, so, uh, by all means, if anyone has a question. I have a question. I'm going to bring this to you so oh. people can hear it. Oh, so that was Gabriel Princip, who was uh, the 18-year-old Serb who shot the shot Archduke Ferdinand. Which, which, yeah. And, and the way back. Is it an app? Uh, it's a website you can go to. So just type type way back machine into Google, and um, you can then search any website you want in the past. So all I had to do was search Dalton's website. And a couple of other schools, by the way, did the same thing. As soon as I started reporting on them, they yanked the names of their board members right off the website. But obviously, they don't know about the Wayback Machine. So it's very easy to type in the Dalton's website and then click on, you know, one week ago. And there they are. They can't hide. Have you seen the criteria, the curriculum that the Governor DeSantis has written to replace CRT? Because as you know, he outlawed CRT. Um, it, it, I was asked if I've seen the new Florida curriculum from uh, DeSantis, presumably his education department, um, and DeSantis has outlawed teach, uh, teaching CRT. And just as an aside, I, I do get asked by some of my liberal friends, well, what do you mean you can't outlaw teaching something? And like, you don't understand, CRT is, isn't being taught as, hey, there's this thing out there called CRT and here's what they believe. And there are other people who believe otherwise. It, it, it's being woven into every aspect of the curriculum, including math and science. Um, including the plays that are put on. A friend of mine's kid had to play racist cop number two in a play at Dalton. Um, and it's being taught as a fact. It, it's being taught as a, a fact that America's founding principles were, were racism. And, and it's being taught as a fact that everything is about race. So that's very different than saying, here's this thing over here, it's called CRT. And I'm not even sure they should teach that. Because not, not every philosophy necessarily has a place in the classroom. I mean, there are lots of crazy philosophies out there, and we've never taught all of them. Um, but, and CRT is, I mean, I'd urge everyone to do their own research. It, it's, it's pretty out there. So, I, but that, to answer your question, I haven't looked at DeSantis specifically. Uh, I do like your governor. I know him personally. Um, he was in my fraternity, I'm, I'm proud to say, although a little after me. Um, and, um, 1776. Um, I, I've heard of it. I haven't done a lot of research on it. Uh, yeah. Larry. Oh, Larry. Larry. Uh, what about Yale? Uh, Bula Bula. Bula. Uh, 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 a subset of what you're talking about, 
which I think is also very important, that goes right along with your, your philosophy, is how they've tried to destroy the testing apparatus, the gifted schools in many cities around the country. And you don't have to take tests, it's got to be done on a quota basis, etc. And I think that's a, a subset of what you're talking about, and it's terribly important too. Well, so everyone should understand what equity means. So the woke left is very facile with language. Um, and uh, CRT, by the way, is being renamed as we speak because it now has the patina, a negative patina to it because of people like me and others. Um, it's being renamed culturally sensitive learning. So if you heard that, hear that term, it's really CRT, also called anti-racism. But the word equity, which is sandwiched in there between diversity and inclusion, um, is really odious because it sounds good, right? It sounds like equality, and that's why they use the word equity because it sounds like equality, so people are easily confused. But really, what it means is equal results. And if you can't get equal results, you've got to dumb everything down till everybody does does equally, which is part of what's going on in New York City. So, um, uh, for instance, at Dalton, I think I mentioned this. They one of the proposals was they get rid of AP classes it, because blacks weren't uh, qualifying for them in the same numbers. So how do you get equity? You get rid of the advanced classes, or you get rid of um, be, having to be smart to get into Stuyvesant High School or Bronx High School of Science. So I actually, one small victory in the culture wars, I, I convinced the headmaster of uh, Brunswick School in Greenwich, where my two boys went, to get rid of the E and DEI, because uh, I, I told them you can't, you know, this school is about excellence. You cannot have excellence and equity in, in the same place. They are mutually exclusive. And he said, you know, you're right. And they got rid of it. So one small victory. But I, everyone needs to understand what that word means. Uh, I have some serious problems with some of the things you've said. And I agree that critical race theory, the way it's taught, is not accurate. But I don't agree that we shouldn't teach history more truthfully about what happened when the, when the British came here, when we took over the land of the Indians, and I know, and I'm sitting here, and everybody here is white, that not one of these people in this audience, including myself, worries when they drive down the street that they are going to be stopped for having something hanging over their, their door, or they're going to be given a ticket because they made a wrong turn. We all know that it's not going to happen to us, and I don't think there's anything wrong in teaching children that there is a difference between the way blacks and whites and Hispanics are treated. I'm not saying that critical race theory is the way to go because I think it's being taught incorrectly. But I think we really need to open our eyes that history is written by the, by the, by the oppressors and by the people that win, not the people that lose. And we need to take a look at what happened here 200 years ago. We don't have to atone for it, but we have to accept it and deal with it. So I, I get a little peeved when I hear this argument, and I hear it a lot, because I, don't, I haven't met a single person who disagrees with the notion that we should teach accurate history. And we have been. And when I was in school, we were taught all about slavery and how awful it was. It, this was not absent from the curriculum. You can't find a single school in America that doesn't teach that. So I don't know. Um, it's like a diversion tactic or something. Because I, I don't know anybody who disagrees with the first part of what you said. Um, but that's not what's happening. It's gone way beyond that. CRT is a whole different. CRT turns Martin Luther King on his head. He famously said, of course, we should ju be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. CRT is all about the color of your skin, 100%. So please don't confuse that with teaching an accurate history of America because they really have nothing to do with each other. And the 1619 Project has nothing to do with accurate history either and has been criticized by legitimate professors everywhere. I have an ongoing dialogue with my millennial daughter oh, good luck. Um, about you know, woke, wokeness. And she wrote the article in Vanity Fair about the African-centric uh, Upper East Side schools. You probably read it, did you? I, I don't think I saw that. Orster, Lysandra, Orster, Lysandra. Anyway, um, so my question is, how? what did the private Upper East Side schools do to the children to make them think this way? Because they're very belligerent about it. They really are. And, and also, um, why is, um, how about the Irish, the Catholic, the Jewish, um, all the other groups that were suppressed? They're not asking for reparations and 
you know, they got on with their life and they made something of their lives. What's, um, I mean, how do you factor into this equation? So, remember, this is being driven by a very small percentage of our society. Social media has really magnified all this in a very bad way. I used to be a big fan of social media when it first came into existence. I thought it was a force for good. And it's turned out to be very much not. Um, so, I, everyone can think back to when they were in fifth grade. Um, you believed what your teacher told you. All right? That was, you know, maybe even in many cases a more influential person in your life than, than your own parents. In fact, most of us were programmed to not agree with our parents. But your teacher, that was the smartest person around, and you believe what they said. So it is not, this is, it's no accident that the woke left has taken over educational institutions because it's an, a huge point of leverage for them because they can train all these kids to think the way they think. Um, incidentally, I should mention there's one interesting thing going on. There's a big uh, schism on the left between older liberals and younger woke progressive, progressives. And I'll, I'll tell you a story that, that highlights that real quick. Um, my publisher, St. Martin's Press, also published a book called American Dirt. Has anyone heard of that book? It was a bestseller. Um, and a significant portion of the people at Macmillan, which owns St. Martin's, did not want to publish the book because they thought it was cultural appropriation because of the story of a Mexican single mother trying to get across the border with her child for a better life in America. But the story was written by a white American woman. So there was outrage and there was a significant movement to shut the book down. They didn't, to their credit. Um, but interestingly, my editor told me at Macmillan it was entirely split on generational lines. And everyone at Macmillan is liberal, right? But all the older liberals said, you know, come on, without cultural appropriation, we wouldn't have the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, right? Um, so there is a big difference, particularly around issues of speech and race. Um, uh, there's a big difference frequently between liberals who might be the age of many of the people in this room and their children. Um, it, it's not, I mean, the free speech movement started at Berkeley, right? The free, that was that, you know, from the left. Um, but the younger left is very anti-free speech, among other things. Oh, I could go on forever. Capital letters are apparently oppressive now. Um, I forget why, but they are, according to some academic. Um, yes, our, so we are all in this room together, and the word diversity is, um, to me, explains all the people in this room. We've all come, uh, our parents, our grandparents, came here looking for a better life. Well, for a better life. Nothing else, the people in this room, their parents, their grandparents, somehow succeeded. They had a fight. They had a fight for their rights. They had to fight for, for getting on with their life. Uh, they were oppressed and all. Um, it's part of the American dream to do that, to fight. It gives you the opportunity to fight. There are not many countries in this world where you can fight. Okay? And the idea that these people have come now with these different rules and regulations or whatever you want to call it, seems it seems almost nonsensical. It's almost like we need to draw a line in the sand and say to your daughter that it makes no sense. That call me mom, okay? What do you want to call me? You want to call me her, it? I mean, does that make any sense at all? <laughs> so we're willing in America to absorb some of these situations and, um, and give it some room to grow and to be thoughtful and everything else. But in the end, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I think what we started to see, particularly in Virginia elections, was the fighting back of this, okay? The whole idea that the parents stood up and said, we won't take this anymore. And I do believe that 2022 elections is going to be fought just on this alone, if nothing else. 
is that the people have a right to suggest that these rules and regulations and thoughts and ideas are not the American way. It's not what we want in America for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, <laughs> and all. And um, that's all I got to say. Well, what's, <laughs> what's going on in Virginia? And I'm a, I'm a Virginia resident now. Yeah, what's going on there um, is being, Alex, I'm going to give you is, So it's being uh, Sorry So Are you trying to speak and I'm supposed to run around with my microphone asking uh, I'm just going to say that it, what's going on in Virginia is um, driven by um, mothers in northern Virginia and almost all of them are, are Democrats um, but the, the state has started, and this philosophy, this evil philosophy, started to mess with their kids. And that's where they drew the line, and they are angry. And you're right, a lot of 2022 will be driven by that same anger. And one thought about America I wanted to add to that is that the words melting, the phrase melting pot, uh, is among the things you're not supposed to say on campuses now, because it implies we melt into an American culture, and that's, a, well, American culture is racist and evil, so we can't have that. And whatever your culture you came from, that's undoubtedly morally, morally superior to our own. So that's among the things that's on the verboten list. Oh, Scott, hi. Alex Donner. Hey, Alex. Nice to see you again. Uh, so you, I, you, I think you brilliantly outlined uh, the, the issue here, but would you talk a little bit about, about the future? I mean, for instance, we, we see all of these uh, anecdotal evidence of these parents screaming at the school board, but are there actual changes in Maine in those schools, I mean, you, you, you made the point that CRT is is hard to identify because it permeates all of the all of the uh, the curriculum and it's not taught as let's say CRT. But I mean, do you look towards the, what the gentleman said that some changes uh, in in our legislators in the midterms, or how, how do you see the the future? How does this get turned around for those who think it's important to turn it around? I, I do get asked that a lot. Um, and you know the, the question is usually phrased as, well, this is a pendulum, right? It's going to swing back, right? Well, sometimes pendulums are wrecking balls. Um, so I'm not very optimistic on this. Even if 2024 election, 2022 election is is a, a wipeout in favor of Republicans, I'm not I'm not convinced that will change a lot. So the answer is these schools aren't really doing anything right now. I mean, uh, they tweak things at the margin. They certainly make sure the words critical race theory no longer appear anywhere. Uh, in, in official documents, so they'll say things like culturally sensitive learning, and that once we figure that out, that'll become some other phrase. So these are very determined people. They don't sleep. They don't care about anything else. Uh, they believe in the long march, which they've lar largely won. Um, so I encourage everyone to fight back, but it's going to take a while and a lot more victories before uh, I get optimistic. One thing I did see that encouraged me um, was the uh, has anyone heard the phrase Latin X? It's what you're supposed to call in woke circles. It's what you're supposed to call Hispanics. Um, it turns out they someone did a poll, and, and the reason for it is because there's there's genders in in, in Spanish, right? You, you have Latinos and Latinas, and well, that would imply there are only two genders, so that's bad. So they came up, and of course, it came out of academics, out of some university, that you should say Latin X, which would encompass everyone. No, all 97 genders. 2% um, of Hispanic people approve of Latinx. 40% are offended by it. So really, I've always defined political correctness as a, a bunch of white people deciding what's best for other people that they haven't actually asked. Scott, uh, first of all, I read your book, and I thought it was a fabulous Thanks. And I'll donate mine today to somebody else. Uh, I also think you are predominantly speaking to the choir here. And most of us would say we can't have conversations with people on the other side because we are immediately shut down. So may I ask you specifically, can you tell us, say, three things that we can do to help solve this problem, save America? Oh my, that's a tough assignment. <laughs> well, I mentioned one already. Stop giving money. 
to educational institutions or other institutions that are doing this. And it's a pretty pervasive list. So you'll, you'll save a lot of money, believe me. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is um, stop being afraid. Uh, count, counter, counter people with facts. Um, like the fact that our, our, the flaws in our country's history are taught in our schools and have been taught for decades. And, and um, you know, we aren't just blind patriots, but we recognize that America is, uh, a, a, is a project. Uh, it's the great experiment that, that the, you know, our founding documents were uh, founded in an age of racism and slavery, but embedded in them was the source code for improvement that will be an everlasting project. And so, you know, to hate our country because of some things that have happened that were awful, um, uh, good luck finding anywhere that doesn't have that in their history, right? But at least we're improving. We, we fought uh, an unbelievably bloody war to get rid of slavery. And yet, the progressive left gives us no credit for all the people that died to make that happen. And I'm going to have to think about the third thing. <laughs> it's a tough battle. I know. You know, you have angry kids. Uh, they don't want to listen. As, uh, I just uh, got a question. My, my daughter, who uh, went to Smith and Harvard and all those places I could never get into, she, uh, uh, she said, Dad, it's very, and she runs special education for a wealthy town. She said, Dad, it's very simple. The rich towns have good schools. The poor towns have bad schools. It's just as easy, as simple as that. Because most of your education is paid, in a lot of states, is paid for by taxes. And the wealthy towns pay a lot more in taxes, and they get good schools. And these poor kids in a lot of areas don't get the education, don't get the opportunity, and so they don't go anywhere. Maybe they go to jail, who knows, whatever. So I'm going to politely disagree with you, which might surprise you. And the reason I disagree with you is because implicit in your, in your question or observation is that money is the solution. New York City spends so much money on education. I think it's up to pushing $30,000 per student in elementary schools. Money doesn't solve these problems. The, sort, the big source of the problems in inner city schools is the teachers unions. They are um, the single biggest, they're one of the single most evil presences in, uh, institutions in this country. And we've seen that in their behavior during COVID. Um, so they're the ones pushing dumbed down curriculums. Um, there's no reason a smarter curriculum couldn't be taught in inner city school. The money is there. There's so much money in New York City schools. And they're terrible. Um, so. You're, you're partially right. I mean, Greenwich High School, I'm sure, has more money than, than an inner city school. But if you look around, I actually did a study once. If you look around the country comparing uh, states and their, their, their school budgets per student and look at SAT scores, there is no correlation between how much money you spend and SAT scores. None. It's really, it's, a, it's how you present. I mean, once upon a time, we had amazing educations in this, in this uh, country in, in cabins, one-room schools, right? I actually looked at the test you had to pass in the state of Nebraska to get from the sixth grade to the seventh grade in 1906, and I would fail it miserably. Um, much more used to be expected of our students. But all the things I've been talking about today, particularly the f equity, are, are driving down the quality of our schools. Are you talking to people in schools? Are there young people that are willing 
stand up to this? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Oh, well, I, wait, I, sh I should say somewhat, <laughs> absolutely. That, that doesn't make sense. But um, most are afraid because if you're in a school uh, and you say something that doesn't tell the orthodoxy, they take it out on you. They didn't used to. I mean, like when I went to Yale, it was a very liberal place, but you were encouraged to say whatever was on your mind. It was, it was wonderful. And, and it certainly wasn't taken out on you. Not true today. Professors will absolutely take it out on you. You'll get a worse grade. Uh, and, and they think they're doing something very righteous by doing that. By the way, congrats on your son's service. My own daughter is at the Naval Academy. So. Right. to <clears throat> add to this discussion only by reciting some of the subtle ways in which this system is controverted. The governor of California is apparently entitled or takes upon himself the responsibility of reciting the different echelons of life in his state every 10 years. And because California is such a large state by population, and because his recommendations in infect the publishing companies, and because the publishing companies the one that I knew about at the time was Doubleday, but there are others. Don't want to keep making new editions of school books, textbooks, for the public schools starting in kindergarten and going up through secondary school. So they pay acute attention to the impressions of the governor of California. He went through, in 2020, analyzing the characters, the um, various skills, uh, the gender, uh, the genetic identity, of all of the different elements in California, including analyzing 68 different languages which are spoken from the north to the south of the state. It was interesting to me that even though he had several kinds of genetic descriptions or Eastern religions and Eastern people who had come to California, there was no mention anywhere in his report of Jews or of Jewish settlers or of the Jewish religion or the Judaic concept in Bible. Nothing at all was mentioned. This was brought to his attention by people in California who thought it was horrific. I think that he went back and altered his report, but it was never distributed the way he had written it initially or with the repairs which he had made. But was there a question? Uh, question? The question is, how can we treat the people who support a governor like that in terms of affecting the school books from which all of our public school kids are being educated? Vote them out of office. <laughs> that's, I, I, I don't have a simple, that's a very complex question. I don't have a simple answer. Uh, but, you know, they tried to get rid of Newsom. They, they want Newsom. They vote him back in. So. Uh, they're, they're getting what they voted for. We got what we voted for in New York City the last few years. One, one quick thought on the previous question, like how to fight back. You had the daughter who's on the fence. Uh, so can I humbly say, I, the reason I wrote Campus Land 
was I thought by putting it in a humorous satire, I might, you know, we might win a few people over, so maybe you give your daughter a book. <laughs> Yes, it, it's Is happening. That ultimately the answer? Uh, I, I tell everyone I meet who's in a position to hire people, look to the service academies because they're disciplined, they're patriotic, they're not going to sue you. They, uh, they, they've gone through five years of service after the academy. Um, their, their teamwork is in their DNA. Uh, these are the people you should be hiring, not, not, I mean, in the Ivies, you've got to distinguish between people who uh, are there for, you know, STEM purposes, the sciences. And, and I would also say that the, the, um, the, the school, like Purdue, Harvard, the land grant universities, there may be some wokeness, but not to the degree of these other universities. So there, I think there is a distinction. Well, when, when I was at Solomon Brothers with Wally here uh, back in the 80s, they barely interviewed beyond Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. I mean, they, I don't think they went to Cornell. Um, and um, that was their shorthand way. Of like, well, those schools have done a lot of uh, sifting for us, so we don't have to do that sifting or the first round of sifting ourselves. But that's not true anymore. Uh, I, you know, Wall Street firms and others, you know, look way beyond the Ivies now. And uh, particularly, you know, you got to look at people's majors. If you majored in anything that ends in the word studies, just don't hire that person. You're you're asking to be sued when you fire them. First of all, I want to thank you for uh, opening my eyes somewhat wider than they were before. I had a peripheral awareness of this problem, but you brought it front and center. And uh, speaking of center, I myself am an independent, uh, kind of uh, a tad right center politically. And what, what you've aroused in me is a further fear that this will become even more of a political issue and, and will um, feed fuel to those on the far right, creating, uh, you know, uh, uh, more us or them uh, attitude throughout the country and creating um, more of a shift to those who favor the far right simply because they oppose some of the things that uh, you've posed as a threat. And, and, and uh, the same people sponsoring this movement are, are dedicated, I think, to the downfall of the capitalist system. It isn't the far right that came up with critical race theory that says we're all defined by our skin color. To me, that's what's separating people, not people on the far right. And to the extent that people on the right are reacting to that, well, they should. And a lot of people on the left are too. Like, as I mentioned, traditional liberals who believe in a liberal society with freedom and free speech. And so they're reacting to it too. Again, this is being driven by a small percentage of people. And as far as the, as far as the far right, I'm, I'm, I've actually never met uh, a white supremacist. I, I'm still looking. Um, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of conservatives. I've never actually met a white supremacist. So, you all know any? Let me know. Okay. You, you've been talking mainly. This is exactly what you're talking. It's been about about the children's world, the true graduate school. Now, once just in the pendulum swing back to normal, once they enter the child market. No, because so that used to be the argument. Um, sorry, we've that used to be the argument that 
oh, okay, well, when they graduate from school and have to pay their first paycheck and see how much goes to taxes, they'll all turn into you know, normal people again. That has ceased happening. So the, our entire country is the campus now. But who would, who would hire a lawyer that doesn't, that doesn't Well, how about a doctor? The American Medical Association is talking about the need for more equity in medical degrees. Do you want a doctor who got there because of the, their, the pigmentation of their skin? The airline industry is talking about the need for equity in airline pilots. Do you want to get on that plane? I don't. I, um, so anyway, the, the, they've, they've taken over the HR departments of every Fortune 500 company. Um, and that, that's really where they're, they're leveraging their power. So they, they haven't stayed on campus. This is the problem. The campus culture is every, it's, campus land is America now. I just wanted to add some things you can do, because I'm, I'm a mom of an eight and 10-year-old, is to get your kids out of the private schools or your grandkids. They don't deserve the $60,000 a year per child. There are schools that are not doing it. In New York City, it's Sacred Heart. It's not, maybe a little bit not as bad. In Los Angeles, there were plenty of Christian schools, Jewish schools that were not teaching. Here in Palm Beach, Rosarian is not doing the woke agenda. So there's always, those schools deserve your money. There's other schools that are charging 40,000, 60,000. It's brainwashing the kids. So that's another thing. The lovely people won't take their kids out, but I think people should start to see that it's time to get away from this school. Uh, here, here. Well, the idea of the Institute is happening right now. Everybody has opinions. You're all listening to each other's opinions but now it's screaming at each other. And so I think it's fabulous. You want one more question and then we're finished. But this is terrific. Thank you. And I hope everybody has something to think about now. So we got one more. Summing up a lot of Speak right into the, yeah. Put it in the center. The media has certainly poisoned a lot of them are responsible for a lot of this. And, and lies repeated often enough become the truth. A good example was today from a, a very lovely lady here maligned the police. I think that if you really studied the numbers uh, of the police, they're, they're really quite good. In other words, 85% of the crime is non white, 85% of that is black on black. So the police are spending most of their time helping the blacks and trying to protect them. Sure, others are lousy cops for, for racist and awful sure. There are 900,000 policemen in the United States. So you can have some lemons in there. But generally speaking, they, they do a terrific job defending and helping the blacks. You wouldn't get that out of the media, but the real statistics of crime in the black community versus deaths in the black community perpetrated by the police. The, the police come out pretty darn good. And, and all we do is the media criticizes the hell out of them. So I think that's all part of this picture. Well, he Heather McDonald. And this whole thing. Anyway, what you're saying is part of a big picture. And thank God you're saying it. Well, thank you. Um, I'd urge everyone to read some Heather McDonald because she's done some great reporting on this. And she is a big believer in data. And the data uh, on police violence is fairly remarkable. You, you, a, a police officer has a 400 times more likely chance of being killed by a black assailant than a police officer killing an unarmed black assailant. And most people think the number of, of unarmed blacks killed by police every year is in the tens of thousands. The, last, the number last year was in the low teens, I believe. Um, and, and you know, so that's just data. Every one of those is a tragedy um, and shouldn't be minimized. But um, when people think the number, the real number is tens of thousands, something's wrong, but, and that's the media. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you all. You can talk to each other. Uh,